was muted. Uh, we want to say thank you to all the organizers of Students as Change Agents, including our coach Steve Norman, for all the guidance during this process. Uh, finally, thanks to Al, Christina and ETAG for partnering with this project. Um, at the start of this project, we had a lot of ideas that we wanted to implement. Um, so our biggest challenge that we faced was narrowing down our focus to a single idea. Um, additionally, also creating a written report and video in such a short time frame. Break in sustainable tourism, we explored multiple areas that had potential for being developed around the idea of sustainable transport. Given the five weeks of project, we decided to focus particularly on how to make the biggest impact within Edinburgh for the long term future. Therefore, we plan to create a much more pedestrian focused city, which we think will create clear benefits for the future. I hope you enjoyed the video. How can Edinburgh create an environmentally sustainable future for its tourism industry? What are the major problems facing Edinburgh? The population in Edinburgh increases every year and in addition with the increasing number of tourists, the city must find sustainable alternatives to allow people to move within it. Private cars are one of the biggest pollutants in main urban areas, raising urban temperatures as well as high levels of air and noise pollution. Studies on urban areas where cars have been partially or totally banned show that the greatest benefit comes from increased physical activity, improving health within the area. Edinburgh is ranked worst for car dependency and over the years the congestion within the city is expected to continue growing. So what is the solution? We will focus on creating a city centre that primarily promotes walking, cycling and using public transport. Our solution is focused on creating car-free city centre, improving public transport and increasing cycle routes to grow a greener city. We wish to implement a people-friendly city centre. Therefore, we aim to reduce vehicles drastically within the city. During peak times of tourism, over the summer months and during December, cars will be swapped for alternative modes of transport to create a safer city. Here in Princess Street, Royal Mile and Cowgate are some of the areas that will be affected. We wish to enhance public transport systems, ensure enough capacity is available and reduce wait times while modernising buses to the same level as the tram system within Edinburgh, making it accessible for all so that people want to use public transport. Currently, cycle routes are used by the minority as many people are concerned about busy, dangerous roads they don't feel confident to rely on cycling. This plan will help expand cycle lanes, prioritising safety and increasing the number of people to rent around the city. These changes will bring a safer, greener city. This plan is designed to improve the quality of life in Edinburgh over the next few years by minimising air and noise pollution, producing a less stressful and healthier city with better use of space, which everyone can enjoy. Most case studies, with even partly pedestrianised city centres, show significant impacts on the environment. The air and noise pollution have reduced significantly. The number of car accidents have gone down. Will Edinburgh be part of this? How will this solution benefit all of Edinburgh? For tourists, the city will be more accessible to walk or cycle. It will become more aesthetically pleasing with less traffic and more efficient and reliable public transport. Residents will face less noise pollution and benefit from wider streets helping the flow of people in overcrowded areas. Badges will be issued to residents to allow access to park near your home. For business owners, you may be concerned with how this will affect income and access of deliveries. Deliveries will still be permitted at slightly restricted times. However, studies show pedestrianised areas increase retail of small businesses by 30%. For the council, huge benefits will be created through encouraging a healthier population and cost a relatively small amount to expand existing cycling infrastructure in the city, making it more accessible to all while promoting new businesses in this sector. 
In 2019, Edinburgh Council conducted a survey targeting Edinburgh residents. 91% of participants supported controlling large goods vehicles within the built-up area. 93% of participants favoured expansion of park and ride facilities as a good way of reducing traffic in the city centre. For disabled people, concerns about accessibility is an obvious concern, but we imagine this to change to make the city a friendlier place with a safer environment for them. Therefore, those with blue badges will still have access to the city in a private vehicle. We also hope to put greater emphasis on more accessibility on our public buses. What are the predicted benefits to Edinburgh? The vision for the future is to have far less dependence on private vehicles. Many cities within the UK are planning to reach this point in the next five years. Making internal changes to the city will also change the city on a global stage and, and attract tourists invested in environmentally focused cities like Edinburgh, which ultimately should improve Edinburgh on the Sustainable Cities Index. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, now we're going to answer questions. So if you want to just type it into the chat box or raise your hand. Um, is there questions? So we have a question. Um, have you thought about how your solution would be funded? So we thought that to implement this project, it would be the city council that would fund it, because obviously they would have many benefits uh, from funding this, such as uh, less road repair due to cars um, like making holes in the road, uh, and it would be cheaper on the long run for them to implement cycle routes and pedestrianised streets. I hope this answered your question. So we have a question from Steve who says, is this plan, if this plan were to go ahead, what would be your first or top priority? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't think we've really thought about this. Uh, we should maybe give it more thought. I don't know if anyone in the group wants to answer that question. Um, I think if it were to be implemented, then um, uh, we would it would be like brought up with the planning group that was on the project of what's feasible to implement first. Um, we have another question from Ruth who says, "What do you think the university and students can do to lobby for this idea to become a reality?" Um, well, in my opinion, I think that obviously we have like statistics that show that um, pedestrianising certain streets would um, reduce significantly the air pollution and obviously would have um, good health benefits on the residents of Edinburgh. So I think that could be arguments uh, that could be used for this idea. I hope that answers the question. And um, Olivia, yeah, go if ahead. I could um, add to that, I would just say that I feel like all of us as young people were in consensus with this and kind of thought this had been something that would benefit everyone. So maybe we could even raise consensus around universities and we haven't discussed it properly yet. Um, so this is something we could look into, but we definitely all had this immediate thought and um, so I think this would be quite a popular idea. Okay thank you. Um, then we have Tina who says lovely video Edinburgh can be hilly and rainy and many of the roads aren't exactly cycle friendly how would you encourage people to cycle? So obviously we have taken this into consideration that it's not easy to cycle around Edinburgh. Uh, mostly the fact is that the cycle routes aren't safe because the cycle routes are often shared with buses 
So to encourage people to cycle, we wanted to create safer bike lanes that are like physically separated with barriers so people would feel safer to cycle. That was the main idea, um, to encourage people to cycle. Uh, so Ayla says, thanks, how would you improve the buses further? They've got one of the most modern fleets in the UK, I think. Um, to answer that question, we haven't really thought about it in detail because we're focusing on other aspects of the project. But I think for the buses, it can often be very confusing as you have many different bus stops, for, for instance, on Nicholson Street and South Park Street. And it's often very congested around the bus areas. So we wanted to maybe implement something that made it easier um, for people to like wait for the bus and find the correct bus stops, if that makes sense. Um, and just to add on this, uh, I think the main thing with the buses um, that would improve them further is by removing cars, then it would make um, the streets less congested and the systems more efficient with public transport in general. Thank you. Um, Kim says, another great video, thanks Team 3. I like that you have thought of the challenges that this might face from lots of different groups and that you've addressed them already. Which group do you think might be more resistant to change and what could we do to change their minds? Um, I think that people who'd be most resistant would be residents because at first they would see all the negative aspects such as not being able to use their car around the city as easily. But obviously that's why we have tried to implement um, different solutions. So we want to add more car parks near the city centre, more park and ride um, facilities to facilitate um, yeah, the going around the city centre. And then obviously once we present all the benefits of this, uh, I'm sure that they will agree with the project. Um, if anyone wants to add something to that. Yeah, and it said in most of our research, um, there was one particular that it took in Nuremberg, Germany. It only took six to eight weeks for people um, who drive private vehicles to adjust to the change and the um, like the rerouting. And often most of the pedestrian or the residents um, said that while it was a challenge at the beginning, they greatly liked the changes that have been made. So I think just showing um, how other residents in other cities have um, responded to the change could also be an added way to kind of um, change their mind, I guess. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from Ian. He says, Great video, guys. Great point raised to achieve sustainability through transport. Is transport the most obvious problem with Edinburgh's festival, amongst other environmental problems? For example, waste. Is there any data to support that? So obviously, I don't think transport is the only problem. You have many different problems. But we can't tackle everything at once. And I think we really like the idea of um, having better transport in the city and pedestrianising the streets. Um, that's just what appealed to us the most, but obviously we need to take into consideration waste and other problems during the fringe, for example. Um, and additionally, the main reason we kind of chose transport and pedestrianising the city centre is to kind of help with the congestion that happens during different festivals um, by having like more space for pedestrians to be it will spread out the congestion throughout the city yeah uh, so after we have a question from Nisha who says how we convince more people to walk on the streets and less people to use private cars post-covid well first of all I'd say that by pedestrianizing streets it makes the streets less crowded so people have a bigger uh, social distancing as they walk because they're not 
all squashed on the pavement. So that would be one argument for that. And also, obviously, private cars um, pollute much more. And so sustainability has really been taken into account during COVID because people have really seen the environmental um, issues that were raised during COVID. Does that make sense? I hope that answered your question. Ian says, would it not be harder to enforce social distancing when the streets become more crowded with more rather than cars? Um, I see the point there. Um, we would have to obviously conduct further studies to evaluate this. But the idea would be that on larger streets, such as uh, the Royal Mile, people would be, there would be the same amount of people, just more spread out. Uh, but we'd obviously have to look into it a bit more. Um, and Olivia, Olivia, if I could just add to that as well. Yeah. Um, I definitely think as well, tourism is not going to immediately jump back to the same numbers we've seen in previous years, such as festivals and things. People are definitely going to feel more cautious post-COVID. Um, so as well, tourism not being back at full capacity, I think will help maintain the social distancing as well. And last, I'm also going to add, um, as Olivia uh, had said kind of in the previous question, currently having limited spaces for um, sidewalk walking, it, it's already difficult for um, people to maintain social distancing on sidewalks. So if you were to open up the entire street, um, it, it'll make it easier for people to kind of um, distance themselves because they have more space than the small allotted pavement available to them now. Thank you. Uh, Minji has a question. He says, how will, the, how will this impact emergency services as the likelihood of incidents will increase with more pedestrians and less road estate for buses and other permanent vehicles? So obviously emergency services would be able to go on these pedestrianised roads. Um, that would not, they would not have to go around the city centre. Um, and I'm not sure if incidents would increase. Um, that We haven't looked into that, but obviously there would be less car accidents because there wouldn't be any cars. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that. In yeah. Three. In, in our research, we um, the, we had an area on casualties um, that we looked into, and currently there's more casualties to pedestrians and cyclists due to cars. So by reducing cars, there should be less um, casualty incidents if the, the issue is the car. So um, I'm not sure about like research on that point, I guess. Um, hi, Ron. This is Al. I'm uh, jumping in there as uh, uh, to to keep things moving with the with the time that we've been offered today. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, uh, say my thank, express my thanks to uh, Group Three there for um, a really well thought out uh, video again, and uh, I mean excellent excellent written report um, explaining how you um, which steps you would want to take in order to achieve your goals. So uh, thank you very much. If um, people could show their appreciation uh, for that group in the chat bar, that'd be fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, and as now we will move forward and um, start to prepare, to, so I can hand over to, I believe it's Amelia in Sustainable Tourism Group 4. Um, and also, um, I'm really sorry, I have to announce an apology. Um, due to an issue on my end, um, we were unable to start recording until about 20 past, which means we lost um, Sustainable Tourism Group 5. But obviously your video and your reports are still going to be available um, uh, through your YouTube channel and, and ours. But apologies for that. Um, but now handing back over to Sustainable Tourism Group 5. Sorry, Group 4. Uh, 
Hi, good morning everyone. Uh, we're team four. My name is Amelia and I've just finished my second year studying medical sciences and I'm calling in from Plymouth. Hi, my name is Niall. I have just finished my third year in mechanical engineering with renewable energies and I'm calling in from Belfast. Um, hi, I'm Rashi. I've just finished my first year studying geography and economics and I'm calling from India. Hi, I'm Sophie. I'm studying geography and I'm about to go into fourth year and I'm calling in from Edinburgh. Uh, I'd also like to mention Ying, another member of our group who sadly couldn't make it today. Um, I'll start off by thanking everybody involved with the Students to Change Agents programme, the organisers, our external partners at Edinburgh Tourism Action Group and also our coach Christina who's guided us through this challenge. It's been a truly amazing experience that has given us a real insight into not only sustainable tourism but Edinburgh as a whole. Um, after our initial research, the conclusion that our challenge here would be to find a solution that not only helps tourism in Edinburgh become more sustainable, but also supports the local businesses that are struggling with the impact of COVID-19. Uh, we believe we've met this challenge by way of a points-based app, and I'd like to play the video now, which we'll hopefully give into more detail. We'd like to introduce you to Charlie. Charlie loves coffee and always remembers her reusable cup. Charlie likes to shop sustainably. Charlie cycles everywhere she goes. Charlie is a good person. Now Charlie is going on holiday to Edinburgh she wants to be a good tourist too. She is one of the 87% of global travellers that wants to travel more sustainably. But Charlie doesn't know Edinburgh and she can't find any sustainable options. In fact, 37% of travellers do not know how to make more sustainable travel choices when on holiday. Luckily, Charlie has an app that will guide her to sustainable options and save her money too. Introducing EcoEddy, an app that shows you where you can eat, drink and shop sustainably in Edinburgh. EcoEddy partners with sustainable businesses, including those that have the Taste Our Best or the Green Tourism Award. Even better, every purchase earns you points that you can spend on city attractions, public transport and future sustainable purchases. So now Charlie knows which sustainable businesses to shop at in Edinburgh and she can save some money too. This is Dave. Dave is seriously passionate about Scottish food and wants to share it with the world. Dave owns a small, sustainably accredited restaurant that showcases local produce. But like many other small businesses in Edinburgh, Dave's restaurant has been hard hit by COVID-19. Luckily, EcoEddy can help Dave too. EcoEddy is going to help boost his customer base by introducing his business to customers like Charlie. EcoEddy brings tourists and businesses together to make more sustainable choices and helps Edinburgh move toward a greener future. EcoEddy, loyal to the environment. Thank you. Hi. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you for listening to our presentation video. Um, does anyone have any questions? So, um, Christina says, great job team. A lot of small businesses have loyalty rewards programs, but they usually rely on printed cards. Do you think your digital um, app-based loyalty program could appeal even more to these small businesses? during this time of COVID-19. Um, while the 
while many find that um, their individual programs, you know, they do work, they're very simple. A lot of the time, um, you're only appealing to the people that are there day in, day out, or, you know, once a week, twice a week. With our program, um, you don't always have to go to the same place. And you can go there once a week, you can go there once a month. At the end of the day, it will still pay off. You don't need to you don't need to go 10 times to actually be rewarded for that. Um, it's a consistent and um, gradual reward that you can accumulate and you will benefit over time um, without any long-term commitments that you may find in local reward programs. Any other questions? So Ruth says, so are you going to take this forward? Um, whilst we are aware of um, the many organisations throughout Edinburgh and Scotland that support local businesses, um, like Scottish M Enterprise, uh, sorry, not local businesses, startups, um, like Scottish Enterprise and Edinburgh Innovations, um, being students, there's a lot of support in the university as well. Um, so this is something we could consider, but we have yet to actually discuss it. Um, but we do believe that there is potential in the site and it could be fully realised given the time and effort. Uh, so also, what were the biggest challenges you faced as a team in arriving at your proposed solution? Um, one of the biggest challenges we had was the was the time zones. Um, between. So we had members in India, we had members in Malaysia as well as um, uh, Britain and Ireland. And geez, those 10 a.m. starts are difficult uh, in between else, but I did. Uh, I was envious of our um, our team members in Asia who who were having a casual seven o'clock meeting. But for me, that was one of the hardest parts. Would anyone like to add to that? Yeah. Um. In terms of the actual um, tackling the challenge statement, we f we found that quite early on, we all agreed as a team that we wanted to look at local businesses, um, as they play quite an integral part in tourism, and they were also quite badly impacted by COVID. Um, and one of our initial ideas was actually to look at making a sort of certification scheme for businesses like the already existing um, Taste Our Best and Green Tourism Award. But once we did research, we found out that those obviously existed. So we had to then kind of come up with an idea that um, encompassed like what already existed. Um, and that took a bit of time to come around to, but we got there eventually. Seems our video answered everything. Um, I would just also like to say in the meantime that uh, this is something that is it's a very focused solution and it is very scalable. And obviously, the longer this goes on and the more it's adopted, the greater um, almost exponential effect that it's going to have in the long term. And the in an ideal world, in 10 years down the line, we find that almost all businesses are operating sustainably um, because of this app. Uh, so also, how would this, um, sorry, how would you make this appealing to all tourists? Um, so for us, um, the number one appeal of this is probably not that you can be a sustainable tourist. For many people, um, and I'm, that includes locals as well, because locals can um, benefit, this, um, benefit from this program. Um, so, the main benefit is probably saving money um, and you're going to be rewarded for um, your purchases over a long period of time and you can spend that where you wish. But for tourists traveling on a budget um, and looking to find almost hidden gems, which has become very common in uh, the recent tourism economy, we believe that tourists will be encouraged and excited to adopt such a program because they can find local businesses they can uh, contribute to the local economy, uh, whilst also saving a, a bit of cash and generally reducing their carbon footprint. If I can just add to that, um, so when we were looking at data early on as well, we saw that <coughs> um, regardless of demographics, most tourists um, want to go to the main tourist attractions in Edinburgh, like Edinburgh Castle. Um, and we thought that if we could just try and offer a discount, 
then that way it would appeal to you know all ages um of 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 tourists visiting edinburgh okay so kim has a question here and it says how would it be promoted to tourists um we all know that Edinburgh Airport and Waverley Station are giant gateways for tourism within Edinburgh. I say that is that's probably where the majority of it comes through, um, other than people driving through to Edinburgh. But what I envision, and what we as a group have already talked about, is just a simple explanation of be rewarded for your tourism purchases, um, with the again being on saving money and um, the the sustainable effect being sort of almost an afterthought for them. But it could be something simple as having um, a single billboard as you come in and out of Waverley or Edinburgh Airport. Um, we think this would be a very accessible application with a consistent UI that would be very user-friendly and very um, pleasing to the eye. So people would be interested in it. Not something very bland that sort of people just pass by without noticing. Is there any more questions? Hi everyone, this is Al jumping in, and uh, just say I think the uh, it would appear that the uh, the questions have been exhaustive for um, in this period here. Um, so can I just ask everyone to uh, like thank thank group four here for um, a really well structured video and uh, and report as well articulating um, everything that, that some, some superb suggestions there about what kind of a sustainability app um, it could do for the local economy and um, with uh, tourists uh, local and international as well. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I hope you've enjoyed taking part in the Students as Change Agents. Um, I will now uh, hand over to uh, Group 1, uh, and I think it's Alicia who I'm handing over to, um, who can now uh, take over from me uh, while I ready up your video, and you can introduce yourselves and, the, uh, and, and your video. Hi, we're SD Group 1, aka Filtration Sensation. We are a team of diverse disciplines ranging from undergrad to masters. I'd like to introduce Sylvia, who you can hopefully see now, who's studying neuroscience, currently in Rome, going into her third year. Argyle, who's going into her fourth year as a law student, coming to us from Glasgow. Eve, studying her master's in energy, society and sustainability, who's in Edinburgh. Nick, studying economics, going into fourth year, who's in London. Jasmine, going into third year, studying economics in Bavaria. And finally, myself, Alicia, I'm studying geography and social anthropology going into fourth year in Edinburgh. We'd like to thank ETAG for inviting us to work on this challenge. We also want to thank Al and his team for delivering this experience under the unusual circumstances. And finally, a big thank you to Elsa for volunteering her time to guide us through this process and offer, offer us her invaluable expertise. In terms of how we arrived at this um, idea. We played around with a range of different ideas exploring supply chains and procurement in the tourism sector and considering reward schemes for local businesses. However, through our brainstorming, we were able to narrow it down and we decided we wanted to pursue something that was smart, innovative and adaptable to the tourism sector's needs. From our research, we discovered the city tree and quickly realised the opportunity to develop and improve the idea to suit our challenge. Um, I would say our main difficulty in the challenge was adapting to the new way of working. Uh, the first week we had to quickly learn to navigate our way through multiple platforms and build a rapport with one another remotely, which was quite difficult. Um, we feel we were really lucky that we were all motivated to make it work and we were flexible in understanding each team member's needs and other commitments that we had going on. Uh, the Students as Change Agent programme has really been helpful in developing a number of key skills 
as mentioned, we've learned to work efficiently on remote problems, gained experience in performing interdisciplinary research and transferred our academic expertise into real life problems. For many of us, um, this is our first time presenting to an external stakeholder and we're really grateful for the opportunity. Al, if we could pass back to you to play our video and then Eve will be on hand to direct any questions you might have afterwards. We hope you enjoy. The challenge that lies ahead to get to net zero by 2045 is an immense one. I think we can conclude that any measures that improved air quality at a population level would have a positive impact on public health. It's a fact that our much heralded Scottish fresh air isn't always as fresh as you might think or might wish. So, you know, small actions can have big impacts. The solution we propose is a portable modular city tree with built-in seating area designed by Green City Solutions. The living wall is made up of moss to absorb pollutants and provide a cooling effect. The genius of this city tree is that it can absorb as much pollution as 275 trees in 1% of the space. Additionally, smart technology is also able to provide real-time measurements of the surrounding environment to provide more accurate data of the environmental impacts of tourism. It is also visually appealing and an interest point that will add to Edinburgh's unique architectural scenery. A key feature within the design is its portable nature. Thus, it can serve a rapidly transforming city such as Edinburgh, which has different seasonal space hands. We believe that Green City Solutions idea can be modified to provide multi-purpose functionality for Edinburgh's tourism sector. This draws on other multi-purpose benches, which have been trialled elsewhere in the UK, incorporating Wi-Fi and other features to adapt to the specific location context. We propose that the city tree is initially placed in these four locations, Princes Street, Waverley Bridge, the Royal Mile and Grass Market. These are tourist hotspots that are either highly pedestrianised for tourists to engage or they experience high emissions. So how efficient is the tree at actually filtering air? Laboratory tests on the city tree were done by Pro Ambient Institute, which proved that the moss wall can absorb 240 metric tons of carbon dioxide per year and 250 grams of particulate matter per day. To put these figures into perspective, one regular tree can only absorb 0.022 metric tons a year. That's 10,000 times less carbon dioxide than the city tree can absorb. And with every innovation Green City Solutions presents, efficiencies will only continue to increase. There are four versions of the city tree which we propose could be used around Edinburgh, and these are aimed at accommodating the different budgets which may be available. The most basic option features the living moss wall and a built-in seating area for the benefit of the public and tourists to use. The second option additionally has hand sanitizer dispensers and smart technology to capture data. The third option provides Wi-Fi and QR codes for tourist activities and educational websites. Finally, the most advanced version of the city tree would be fully fitted with all multi-purpose features, including publicity screens to advertise tourist events and sustainable methods. Green City Solutions has already secured funding from Climate Care IC and various other stakeholders dedicated to climate change. We are therefore confident that the City of Edinburgh would be able to obtain the necessary funding for the city tree's implementation. We propose that a big portion of the funding would come from the government's climate change fund and if the Edinburgh City Council were to consider the worthwhile, we would expect some funding from them as well. Lastly, since publicity screens on the side of the tree are an option, we consider the opportunity of potential funding from companies that are looking for advertisement space. 
The City Tree is an ideal solution for helping Edinburgh reduce its high emissions and for helping Scotland reach its net zero of carbon targets. Not only can it drastically reduce CO2 levels, filter harmful particulates and collect invaluable data, it also has the potential for much more. To raise awareness of and engage tourists in sustainability and provide a space for advertising, learning and even hand sanitation in a post-Covid reality. There is a whole world of opportunity with the Green City Solutions City Tree. Okay, thank you very much for watching. Um, I'm Eve, I'm coming to you from Edinburgh. If you've got any questions, if you just want to type them into the chat box, otherwise raise your hand and we'll work through everyone. Thank you, Ruth, Steve and Caitlin. Any questions or just waiting for people to type them out there? Ilse, if you just want to speak. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Okay, first of all, team, I want to say congratulations. I'm very proud of you. You're all looking very smart as well. Um, I was going to ask about, have you thought about how it, how it would be maintained and, and how, that would, how that would happen? Yes, so for this question, I'll pass you on to Sylvia. Hi. So um, we've looked into maintenance costs and how it should be maintained and different articles as well as Green City Solutions say that there should be only a few hours of maintenance per year. And furthermore, if you incorporate the smart technology, there's a maintenance app connected, which can tell you exactly what's going on with the tree in virtual times, let's say. And so there shouldn't be any costs and continue, continual maintenance. Um, the only thing we've considered is potential costs and maintenance of cleaning. But we think that would just go along with the general, let's say, Edinburgh cleaning of the streets. And that would be part of the city council. I hope that answered your question. OK, thanks. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, next question is from Joshua. Have you seen this being successfully implemented across different global cities over the long term? That's a great question. I'll pass you on to Jasmine for that, who has some statistics over the efficiency. Hi, uh, thanks very much, Joshua. I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah, so the tree, the company Green City Solutions uh, was founded in 2014 um, and in 2016 they put their first city tree, the first prototype in Dresden in Germany and then just from there it kind of took off in 2018 they released a lot more all over Germany across um, Europe in the Netherlands as well and um, there's actually two in the UK. There's one in London, or I, I say the project was done in London. There was a few places around the city and also a few in Glasgow. And they've actually seen some positive results with them. Um, so unfortunately, there's not enough data that we can access from their website to talk about the efficiency. But a lot of um, research has been done in laboratories on the trees um, to see how much they can absorb, how much CO2, and also how much particulate matter they can filter from the air. So I hope that uh, answers your question. Could I just add to that quickly? Sorry. Um, just to say that there's also been, uh, they've been used in Oslo and that was a really, really successful project. And specifically, they were found to really increase tourist engagement. Um, and that can be really useful in like wayfinding within the city. And that was something that they found them really useful for in that example, which is just another global city. Thank you, Alicia. Our next question is from Ruth. She says, have you considered crowdfunding if the council government couldn't fund it? Um, I'll take that question myself. So when we were looking at funding, Green City Solutions, who developed the tree, had all already secured funding from the EU, the Crown Estate and Climate KIC. So they would be our main sources um, supplemented from the council, but certainly we could look at crowdfunding as an extra source of funding, as well as if we were to have the advertisement boards, we could generate income from that as well. But certainly that's something we can look into for the future. So thank you for that question. The next question is from Steve. He said, could you see these appearing on many streets in Edinburgh away from tourist areas? I'll pass that question on to Alicia. 
Yeah, so we definitely could. Um, one great feature of these walls is that they're portable. So that's absolutely brilliant because we can move them to different areas of the city and trial them there to find out where is the most effective places for each of the different functions. Um, so we could see them appearing in lots of places. One that we particularly look to put one is the airport, which obviously is more for tourists. But we think that would be really essential to the whole scheme working better because it would immediately situate tourists within this idea of having city trees and having them as kind of a framework to explore the city and to move between um, and then we could we would love to move them to different places as well so that residents can benefit also but i think a key feature of this is that residents benefit as well as tourists from it and that's something we really cared about in our solution was that it was year round and it wasn't solely focused on tourists I hope that answers the question thank you alicia and um, the next question is from Valentina. She asks, have you thought about moss species which Scottish ecological protection organisations could work with to decide on this? Scottish peatlands are an obvious place for inspiration. Thank you, Valentina. That's a great question. Um, we've based the moss that we would use off what Green City Solutions have tested in their laboratory, depending on what can absorb the most CO2. Certainly, if this was to be taken forward, we could work with external organisations to develop a moss that is the most suitable for Scotland. I know the city trees have um, been put into cities in Scotland, such as Glasgow, so we could use that as a case study to see what could work best. But thank you for that question. May I also just jump in really quickly just to say that um, um, having done a bit more research on the actual technology behind the tree, um, one thing that Green City Solutions is quite proud of um, is the fact that the moss that they use is just the typical moss that you would find growing kind of near like rivers and near uh, on buildings like that. It's just it's um, just usual moss that you would find anywhere. There's nothing very particular about it. So um, obviously there could be work with done with the Scottish peatlands um, to follow the, the different ecological protection organisations, but. At the end of the day, you know, it's it's a moss that can be found anywhere, so um, it wouldn't really be too difficult to get it from around Scotland. Thank you, Jasmine. Al, I want one on campus. Me too. Uh, is there any more questions? Otherwise, we'll wrap up today and we can pass on to the next team. Kim. Great presentation, Group 1. I like that the multi-purpose helping to measure as well as solve the issue and looks good too. Nice combo of IoT and nature. Did you consider creating something similar from scratch rather than procuring an existing solution? So I'll take on that question. Um, we decided we looked at many options, as Argyle mentioned, and it was on Mural that we decided that we wanted something a bit we wanted to use smart technology, wanted it to be data-driven, innovative, and also add on to measuring to solve the problem rather than just um, putting a solution in for the short term. We did consider some um, ideas from scratch, but we saw that this had worked in other cities, and for us it seemed like an obvious solution that we could implement. Um, quite quickly and we could also adapt it to fit into Edinburgh um, with the hand sanitation, advertisement boards, etc. But yes, that's probably why we arrived at this solution over anything else. But thank you for that question. I don't see any more raised hands or anyone typing in the box. So. I think that's it for today. Thank you very much for watching our presentation. That's fantastic. Um, uh, thank you everyone um, in group one there. Um, really well handled with the questions um, and passing from one to another. And the, uh, you've inspired many folk um, that have joined us today, which is fantastic to see as well. And uh, thank you very much for that. And yeah, I absolutely look forward to seeing um, uh, one on campus and we'll, we'll contact SRS um, after this and see see how we go about that. Um, right, now um, we'll do the, uh, the last presentation of this session. And so um, it's a single tour in group two and I'm happy to pass over to, I think in this section, it's Caitlin.
Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us this morning to listen to our ideas. I'm here to introduce ST Group 2. Um, my name is Caitlin, and also in the group we have Irene, Jaja, Ben, Hannah, Sadie, Alex, and Tanya. We all come from different backgrounds and degrees in countries, but we're all passionate about making Edinburgh a more sustainable place. Um, we'd like to thank the Students' as Change Agents team um, Ag and our group coach Ross for helping us throughout this challenge and now I'm going to pass over to Ben. Thanks Caitlin. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Ben. Um, I just want to thank everyone again for the opportunity. We've learned so much and thank you for listening. Um, so firstly our main challenge was just confidence in communication online. All of us are a bit shy, it's quite hard to overcome that but once we did we decided that um, narrowing down our focus was the best way to brainstorm any ideas. So after the first week, after some initial research, we found that public perception was the best way um, to challenge uh, Edinburgh's sustainability, basically. Um, so we found that transport, waste and recycling and small businesses are not only most affected by COVID-19, but can most effectively be changed to increase Edinburgh's sustainability. Um, so we noticed that public perception closely links all of these aspects and by tackling public perception, um, we are also tackling these aspects simultaneously. Um, so like everyone, like, like a few other people groups, um, our idea is an app uh, like a game that incentivizes the use of public and active travel, reduces waste and increases recycling and supports environmentally sustainable local businesses. Um, so thank you again for listening um, and I hope you enjoy the video. Globally, the tourism sector has been hit hard by the coronavirus pandemic. Edinburgh's five annual summer festivals, which are attended by 4.4 million people every year, have been cancelled for the first time in over 70 years. As people are turning to big companies they know and trust, one fifth of small local businesses could collapse. It is becoming increasingly important for Edinburgh to create an environmentally sustainable future in the revival of its tourism industry and festivals after this crisis. Edinburgh currently faces several challenges with sustainability. 57% of Edinburgh's tourists come from the rest of the UK, mainly using petrol cars and domestic flights, whereas only 5% of Scottish transport greenhouse gas emissions are from public transport. Although there has been some improvements recently, the festivals still have a big problem with paper and plastic waste. The In The Loop campaign found that half of people dispose their waste on the go and that in Edinburgh, one third of materials thrown to street bins could have been recycled. So, how can people be encouraged to use public transport and active travel, to waste less and recycle more, and to visit local sustainable businesses? Taking into account stakeholders and the effects of COVID-19, these problems can be tackled by changing public perspectives. What if tourists' mindsets can be changed from merely being a visitor to being a guest? and locals' day-to-day -day behaviour can become more sustainable. Our solution for all the highlighted problems while keeping small local businesses afloat is an app, specifically a game that will encourage sustainability around Edinburgh. The principle of the app is to gain enough points to level up and grow your own virtual tree. We believe this will make users more inclined to protect and care for our city. To gain points, tourists and locals need to perform environmentally responsible actions or actions that help sustain the tourism industry post-COVID-19. For example, supporting a local business, recycling a plastic bottle, using a water refill station, buying a public transport ticket, attending organised events such as a litter pick or visiting touristic landmarks. These actions can be translated into points by scanning a code into the app via your phone. QR codes can be placed on recycling bins at the till when purchasing from a local business, on bus doors and on tourist landmarks. Our map feature will easily point out the locations of local businesses, recycling points, bus stops and tourist landmarks. This will make it extremely easy for users to take action, especially when finding and locating small businesses. The app will also count steps and the distance you have walked, translating this information into points. When you open the app on your smartphone, 
a map appears on your screen where you can see your current position and nearby places where you can gain points. If you tap on the icon at the top right hand corner of the screen, you can switch to camera mode and scan the QR codes around the city. The bar at the bottom of the screen shows how many points you have accumulated and if you tap on the tree icon, you can see how your tree is growing and share your progress with your friends and family on social media. A breakdown of the points you have collected is also available. If you tap on one location, you can get details about it and directions on how to get there. You can also type in the search bar to find a specific place or choose an itinerary from the ones recommended in the menu, where you can also find useful links to learn more about sustainability and the city of Edinburgh. In addition to individual users, local businesses can also be included in our app. Businesses can build their points profile by being environmentally sustainable. Let's demonstrate with Cafe's A and B. Cafe A recycles. Cafe B recycles, but also uses refillable bottles and sources locally. When a tourist buys a coffee at Cafe B, they receive three points, compared to only one point when they purchase from Cafe A. This will incentivize local businesses to be more environmental. Motivation for tourists and locals to use this app, apart from the reward of watching your virtual tree grow, are financial discounts and materialistic rewards. When a tree finishes growing, a spin wheel will allocate prizes which can involve discounts, free coffee or dessert at a local business. The ultimate prize is discounted and free tickets to a friend's show. Thank you for that. I hope you all enjoyed uh, watching that. Um, so if you want to ask a question, just raise your hands or put it in the chat and I'll uh, read it out. I can't see raised hands, so if you have raised your hands, just whack on your camera and you can ask the question. Thank you, Ruth. Where can we download the app? It's not ready for download right now, um, but hopefully with some funding it will be. Um, yeah. So from Al, how would you look to unite all the local businesses in the city? Does anybody want to answer that? Okay, I'll answer that. Can everyone hear me? <laughs> okay. Um, so how it would probably work would be that um, the local businesses who wants to be involved in the app should uh, sign up, uh, either get into contact uh, with the app or they can log in because there's going to be a tourist slash user login and also a business login so they can sign up that way and um, this way uh, tourists and locals can easily source where local businesses are and easily support them through COVID-19. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, so Steve's asked how do you persuade businesses to offer these discounts? Where does the money come from? I can answer that one. Um, so to begin with, we're just looking for the game aspect to um, get people to use it. So the growing the tree, we sort of thought it would be a bit like Pokemon Go. Um, but obviously, we need different stakeholders to be on board with offering the rewards um, for the people who do grow, manage to grow their tree. Um, but we think that the local businesses would want to be involved because if they have a sustainable business and people can get points by going to them then this should increase the footfall at their business and um, the amount of people that want to visit them and then in the future obviously that could help with their profits um, and just getting their name out there so we think that they'd be willing to um, be a part of that. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, another question from Christina. How do you think the social aspects, e.g. growing and sharing your tree, would add to your app's appeal and user buy-in? I can take this question. 
Oh, thanks, Irene. Uh, so we did some research and we found out that um, there's this process called the gamification of tourism, which is something that people are now uh, seeking for because with the development of new technologies, tourists want to have like new experiences, which um, uh, could be more personal and more involving. And we found out that uh, playing a game um, would also like a game that has like a, an augmented reality technology, like Pokemon Go, for example, uh, really makes uh, creates a bond uh, between the user and the place they're visiting, and it can also increase loyalty to the destination, which would benefit Edinburgh. And also, we found out that people really download these kind of games just because of the fun of playing. So it could be beneficial, like there, there might not even be the need to have um, money rewards. So it could be just a good way to make people play in Edinburgh and enjoy the city. I hope that answers everything. I think it does. Thank you, Irene. Cool. Any more questions? Kim says, thanks team two, another fab video. I like the gamification of growing your own tree. Would you differentiate between a residence and a tourist to account for different amounts of time or only aim it at tourists? I think um, when you log in, you can log in as a resident, a business or a tourist, to my understanding. Um, and based on that, different amount of points will be rewarded. Um, but if anyone wants to add to that, um, feel free to. Uh, yeah, uh, so this app will definitely bring together tourists and locals, but I think what we were thinking was if it was a tourist, each action would translate to more points, whereas if it was a, a local, uh, maybe slightly less points. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so that like for locals, they can like keep on doing it again and again for a long period of time, whereas tourists, they can earn benefits uh, just from being there for a short time. Thank you. Um, so Ruth, are there any existing tourism organizations you could partner with on this? I don't know about tourist organizations, but I know um, definitely the city, uh, I mean, the University of Edinburgh, that's, um, you know, um, a big stakeholder that can uh, we can partner with and I can really branch out there and you know get young people on board and if the younger generation gets on board then most other people do too um but i don't know about tourism organizations specifically unless anyone else does in the group um, um i just like to say that probably um would be good to work with the fringe society because obviously they already have their own app and they've been doing a lot the past few years to try and improve the sustainability specifically around the fringe and the other festivals that are on during the summer. Um, so I think that would be one group of people that um, we'd like to partner with. Thanks, Caitlin. And yes, yeah, Steve, I did mean you all these. Um, cool. Any more questions? Cool. If there's no more questions, uh, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I, I want to say thanks for everyone for all the ideas. If any of them could be materialised properly, that'd be amazing. You know, sustainability is something that we all care about a lot, and it'll be awesome. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you everyone uh, for taking part thank in this. You. Thank you. Um, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone um, in that group. And if people can show uh, a virtual round of applause uh, in the chat box, that'd be great. Thank you. And um, uh, so. I've been really enthused by listening to everyone over the last half an hour, uh, sorry, hour and a half. And, and it, it has really struck me um, that yes, there have been three apps and we've also had suggestions of City Tree and Car Free City. Um, they have all had at one point or another moments of crossover. And, and before we hand over to uh, colleagues for their final comments, um, I'm actually gonna try and put all of you change agents back onto the spot now um, uh, and actually ask you which elements from other groups kind of 
ideas or suggestions or proposals that you've seen this morning um, do you think that you've been really inspired by and you think oh hang on if we could work with them to bring that together um, then I think we'd have something even more special to add to the, what, whatever your group's created so it's, it's a very this is a very good question and it's kind of um, very on the spot I, I know but if anyone would like to put a hand up or kind of volunteer to to answer that uh, that that would be that, that would be really good and I'll also say the reason I'm asking is because yes yes now we'll come to you next the reason I'm asking is because yes this is Gene's exchange agents and we've partnered with Kim from eTag to kind of pose this question and we don't really have anything about what's next but actually there is so much energy about what could happen next and yes we'll partner partner with colleagues from Edinburgh Innovations, but we've got time to have some conversation now. So um, I'm going to uh, mute myself and hand over to Albert. So if you'd like to, to say something, and then we'll go to Benjamin and, and Caitlin. Uh, hi, so uh, I'm part of group five and uh, we had this conversation with our group yesterday actually, but um, group uh, four and one, I think, also had the app ideas that were really kind of similar to our app idea. Um, and we saw we saw group four's idea in the kind of PowerPoint bit that we did like a couple weeks ago. Um, and we kind of like thought about data sharing at that point. But um, obviously kind of it, it feels like they really our, our ideas are like all the same kind of app interactive map point system kind of thing so I don't know if it would be a good idea to kind of incorporate them or work together on them uh, at all I know that kind of group one seems to focus a lot more on the kind of game point aspect and I think we have a website in the group so, so obviously it's a bit different but yeah uh, I, I know our, my group all kind of agrees with that sentiment that's great, thanks, Albert. And uh, so uh, uh, Benjamin said that the uh, the group for us seemed great. So linking the moss with the apps would be would be great. Caitlin um, has said about the uh, fourth group's idea could be integrated to the app. Uh, the idea of like Eva suggested about QR codes on the side of the city tree into some of these apps. And um, uh, Tara, I'm very happy to hand over to you. Hi. Uh... I think um, our group, I think I really liked a lot of the app ideas that the other groups had, um, particularly the first one. Um, I think when we were developing our idea, we had wanted to add some sort of an app component, but due to the time, we had to specifically just focus on um, the zoning pedestrianization idea. But I think it would be really good to have like an app in um, uh, collaborate collaborate with kind of the pedestrianized zones to promote the businesses in those areas um, and also encourage sustainable practices um, in the zone pedestrian areas. That's great. Thank you so much for, for, for that, Tara. Yeah. Um, it'd be fantastic to see how we bring things together. Is there any other um, comments or thoughts from change agents um, on this subject? Or indeed any of the guests that we have uh, visiting us and joining us this morning? Can I just um, say absolutely blown away with a lot of your ideas and um, it was so interesting just to hear where you're all calling in from what subjects you've studied what year you've been in but without exception each of your teams has gelled really really well and there's been quite a lot of movement we've noticed from the peer presentations when your ideas were just beginning to form there's been cross fertilization of ideas and that's exactly what change agents is about it's not territorial it's not exclusive it's about collaborating to, to come up with a solution. So I think the idea is that in the chat box and Al encouraging you to take your skills to the next level is something to really pay attention to. So you've all shown yourselves to be incredibly enterprising, um, problem solvers, go-getters, and some of you may be interested in taking it to the next step and actually becoming entrepreneurial with this. So just a, another plug for any of you who, who do want to take this further to speak to Edinburgh Innovations and they would be more than happy 
to help you with that. So thank you all and congratulations again. Excellent. We're now going to try, depending on uh, internet capability, to try and hear from Kim. Over to you, Kim. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, I'm so pleased because um, I really didn't want to end the session without being able to um, properly express my thanks to everyone for who's taken part. Um, I said this on the session last week, but um, I we're really blown away with the quality and the diversity of the ideas that you've brought to the table. You've um, all come up with such different ideas, but and I'm so pleased you just had that discussion there about how they all complement each other because they're, you know, I think if, if we could bring in even parts of all of the ideas that we've heard, um, it would go a really long way to genuinely uh, address the challenge that we've got. So um, I really want to thank you. And also um, just to compliment you all on both your reports, which were all great, but also the way that your videos supported and advanced your ideas um, and for your creativity in bringing those videos to life. Um, it's it's really, really impressive. Um, so I just wanted to properly say thank you to everyone. Um, and I really hope that you, you do, you know, consider taking some of these ideas forward um, and kind of working on them a little bit more um, because it would be great to see the, these things come to life. That's fantastic. Um, uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Kim, for those comments and supporting the programme. Um, and yes, I am uh, sure that we will have some change agents in contact with you again in the future. Um, uh, as, as I say, this doesn't need to that this doesn't uh, need to end today. Uh, it's very much about um, the start for, for, for many elements of the um, of people in, involved in in the uh, uh, sustainable tourism post COVID nineteen. Um, so yes, a final thank you to everyone who's joined us today and across the last four weeks. If you are doing a slick or doing your completing your Edinburgh Award, um, then good luck with that. I know you've got deadlines that you need to uh, keep to for those. And if you need any help, then there is a wealth of support across change agents um, in the community and, um, and with folk like myself and, and those change agent team, the coaches as well. Um, so uh, just a final thank you to everyone for, for taking part today. And uh, we hope to see you again in the future. Um, but please stay in contact with us through Twitter and through Instagram. And um, if you are on LinkedIn, then connect with us and, uh, and follow uh, Jesus Change Agent um, LinkedIn pages as well. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, take care and have a great rest of the day or indeed rest of the evening, depending on where you are. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. And just the four of us left in the session. Well, that was pretty smooth. If Harris had a meltdown in that, nobody was remotely aware. <laughs> so well done. <laughs>
Oh my goodness, I was so flustered at the start. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't worry. I think it, it was smooth. If you hadn't um, admitted to not having recorded it, nobody would have known. Well, they were, when they clicked through to pressing record or watching it, and then group five would have been, where are we? <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was best to tell in the session rather than uh, uh, rather than a message later. But um, it went, um, it did go very well, I thought, um, today. Yeah. And um, I think we, we, we were able to address the fact that three acts were created by tying it together quite well at the end. Yeah. And even, well, I know the two of them were more similar. The, the, the gaming one was slightly different. The, the other two were much closer, but it still came across as ever so slightly different. It's only when you really analysed what's different that you would struggle. But, but I think it worked well with them spread out the way you had them to every other one. So. Yeah. Steve, how's it for you? It's great. Really impressed. I, I kind of was impressed by the quality of the videos uh, as well as the ideas. I thought they handled questions um, kind of really well. I thought they had some really kind of interesting solutions and you hope that this doesn't just become an academic kind of exercise, that there is something there is something in that uh, that clearly thought about it. You could see, I mean, again, in terms of group, you, I could see the progress um, that they had kind of made, uh, which was which was quite nice. Um, so yeah, so I just think it's uh, fantastic. I just, you know, I always feel quite um, proud to be part of the university when we've got people like that here. <laughs> have, over, you know, but, she said she had this lovely, warm, fuzzy feeling inside watching it. <laughs> so. Yeah, it is particularly at this time as well. I just think it just it's just really great, you know, that these that, that we've got these, and we always knew we'd have some great students and stuff. Uh, but it's great with them sort of like full of ideas and stuff. Even for as old as Ben had said. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't know if any of you have a chance to. Um, I don't know if any of you have had a chance to look at the the written reports for for this cohort alone. Um, uh, so it should be in your uh, read, Steve, in your email. Um, I'll, have a, I'll have a look at that. There's um, uh, I mean, group group three. I think it's just how they've been able to create it. Um, uh, I'll, sh I'll just may as well just share just share my screen here. Um, is it looks so so like professional and kind of like it's not that kind of report written text academic report that we've seen quite a few create. That I've got no uh, doubt whatsoever that I've, I've met when like Kim and others that will will see these and they'll, they'll take them and, and it's really easy just to take this and like promote it or or use it yeah. itself. Um, it's been really fantastic to see. That is amazing. That's the sort of thing we should show our next cohort of change yeah. agents at the very beginning. And this is what we want to see, not text and references and bibliographies. Yeah, yeah. This is the you can uh, um, you can really. I was chatting to Christine the other day. You can really see the groups that watch the Social Enterprise Academy um, frame your finding session on, and where they were talking about. Because um, so I had a conversation with Elsa and uh, Lucy about impact reporting, um, and you can really see how some groups have taken that and pushed themselves to create documents like that, um, uh, and then others that, whether it's for running out of time or whatever or comfort, um, have gone. Oh, let's just get a load of text down. But it's been brilliant to see. And out of twenty groups, you know, there's very few of them are really plain boring text that mostly made an effort. I'm just thinking about Winston from the business school. Which group was he coaching? Which topic? I Do can't you know? remember off my head. I will in one second I'll find it. While you do that, I started looking at um, questions for coaches. So while you're on Steve, um, just uh, general impressions of being a coach. Obviously you do coaching as part of your normal role, but it, has this been very different? Is it what you expected? A, a little bit. I mean, again, I, I think what's interesting is that from my perspective, I've also had the student experience with the so much information and trying to find it. Um, but it is there. Uh, and so I think that's been kind of useful. Uh, mixed attendance sometimes at the kind of the groups. And um, I suppose with my group particularly, I, I've, I've had to kind of sometimes drag questions, drag answers out of them. So I've had to use my kind of coaching to kind of do that. 
Um, and obviously there is a bit, there was a little bit at certain points where you could see they were, you know, almost like they, they were in my meeting because they wanted to just uh, say cheerio <laughs> and get on. <laughs> Very aware, and I think Ros mentioned it as well about length. So I set up an hour, but it became clear that I was just checking in, just giving some kind of feedback, asking. And then, you know, it's almost like now, because you, you've got lots to do and this is a bit of extra time that I'm going to be giving you back. So I thought that was that was the way that I kind of um, uh, approached it. Mm. But it's good. I mean, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed by how much information they've had to kind of take in um, and and all the help as well around it. I mean, I think that it's a very it's a very impressive program. Um, I can't help myself. I've got a session with them on Friday just to debrief. I'll probably be asking them how they're going to talk about this in terms of if they were talking in future applications. I can't help myself. And I've, that, has so come, that, has, that has come in a few times in terms of saying, well, this is, you know, something like this is something employees would really be appreciative of and stuff, because I don't want them to lose that, uh, how they talk about their role um, if they're putting it into kind of applications. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying a wee job there for you, Steve. Quick top tips from a careers consultant that we can send round to the groups. <laughs> Translating this into job applications and, and interviews i'm happy to do that that would be really yeah. helpful and just really informal the, the way you would be yeah. talking to your group rather than anything yep. yeah yeah happening. absolutely so remember those that are doing the uh edmund award probably will probably do that in probably, some end. yeah yeah um uh, but we also I mean, in our in in the survey we like uh, change agents we do ask how you're intending to use it or have you used it already so we're Trying to plant those seeds there, Steve. Can I just check? Did um, because uh, you did Fuko complete with your group? No. No, I just can say because I know that I've listed them in here, but I didn't haven't seen them. Earlier. No. Um, but even even still, you still have them. Um, uh, what Lisa coming in from Helsinki, Olivia in Biarritz, and then uh, and then the remainder coming in from UK. Really interesting. Really interesting. I found that one of the most fascinating elements how we've been able to bring people together that yeah. that we've walked past each other and on uh, Bristol Square and <laughs> to now being in an MS team forever. But you know, is that not really funny that these guys might end up walking past each other on Bristol Square and you wonder, will they actually recognize each other? Yeah, and oh my God, it's you. Yeah, <laughs> that would be really funny. That would be funny. Yeah. Right, that's, um, you guys, you have met Steve in the flesh, have you? No, no, this is the first time I've met. No, have it, no, no. <laughs> but again, yeah. this is interesting because obviously this is um, a learning curve for all of us as well, I think, in terms of doing this kind of online and I think for the students as well sometimes because I think in my job, the, the, the students are not as quite as confident as we might think with this technology. Um, we've always assumed, you know, apps and uh, smartphones and stuff like that but actually they, they sometimes so they've had to so i think again they've probably learned you know presentations and stuff like that so so that's quite interesting as well i think yeah. I, I was really blown away by the fact so with my the group that i was coaching um none of them had uh, had received an online lecture before um before they joined change agents and um, so as much as we were talking about it happening really quickly at the university that i'm you know first second and third and postgrad students, I think I have in mind. None of this was the first, so when they had, went to collaborate and Ruth started talking at them on the introduction, that was the first time they'd experienced it. And then <laughs> through them into an MS team school, um, uh, which, and we all know it took um, a couple of weeks to get used to MS team school when we all got locked down. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you could see, and well, we saw it on the coach chat in, in Teams saying, oh, they're not liking Teams, they're not liking Mural. Um, and then, as they got, as naturally as they, they used it more and got more confidence within it, um, then they've, they've absolutely, um, you know, when you're talking about employability and, and, and interviews, then these are definitely some of the tangible things they can be able to, to use in future, um, future interviews. My team, were, my team were terrified of Mural, and then I asked them at the last one, I said, how was Mural? And they went, fine. You know, they're, they're kind of used to it. Again, it's it's once you start doing it and then and, and that kind of experimentation and not having to get something perfect the first time, I, I think is is great. But yeah, this kind of technology, sharing screens that they found sometimes difficult and obviously the etiquette of chat when it's like this, but all good, all good, I think so. 
Yeah, and I've been really impressed how Teams has worked so well for us. You know, the fact that they can have their files in there and refer to things and we can see what they're saying and speak to them there. It's been a joy. Teams is just a whole different level to me now than it was before. <laughs> just in this, you know, I've used it infinitely more in this than anything else. Because I quite often still default to email for chat when I, I should be using Teams. I am trying, but. We're all getting there. Right, this has been great, everyone. I'm going to go and. Uh, uh, Thanks very much. Come back too. Thank you very much, Steve. Thanks, guys. See you this Cheers afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for seeing everybody. Thanks, Steve.